ladies. I look like the stereotypical runner. <laughs> I know. So my journey into running happened because of my mother. My mother taught me to be a strong black woman. She wanted me to see the world and absorb every part of it. She and my dad would take me on endless vacations, trips all over the world. They wanted me to know that I was not bound by my zip code. There were supposed to be endless mother-daughter trips, vacations in our future, but that all changed when my world was sent into a tailspin. On July 9th, 2011, when my mother, Gail Eleanor Moxley Chenault, lost her battle with cancer. She was 64 years young, and I was 37 years old. My mom was my best friend, my world, my everything. Out of all of my friends, I was the first person to lose a parent. I became part of that club that no one wants to be in. I knew I had to function and keep going because that's what my mother would have wanted. She, would, she wouldn't have wanted my spirit to die. Growing up, my mother would constantly tell me she never wanted anything or anyone to mess with my spirit. I'd always been independent, self-assured, fearless. My mama made sure of that. But after her passing, all that became buried in grief. I knew I had to keep going. I knew I had to function because that's what my mother would have wanted. I had to be the strong black woman. For me, functioning meant that my spirit was fine. Or so I thought. I got up, I taught my classes, I tried to be social despite feeling the weight and heaviness of grief. I just kept being that strong black woman. Being that strong black woman is deadly. It literally kills black women. It was killing me. I kept going, I kept functioning, just kept moving along. So, Six years ago, a friend of mine asked me to join her 5 pound relay team because they were short a person. I walked every once in a while, but really <laughs> nothing about like running. So as the saying goes, unless I'm being chased, why run? <laughs> but because I was a strong black woman, I said yes, but I wasn't sure what I was getting myself into. And if I were truly being honest with myself and the world, I would have said no with a couple other words in front of that no. <laughs> I train, sorta, for the day. But when the race day happened and I saw thousands of runners, it hit my nerves hard. I knew nothing about running, race culture, the whole running experience. But there I was, world, check me out, bib number and everything. I now know your bib number should be below your chest. <laughs> I was a hot mess, just a hot mess. But somehow, some way, I finished my first race. But something happened in those five miles. Scientists may call it endorphins or an adrenaline rush, but in those five miles, that weight of grief that had been on my spirit, breaking it, just obliterating me, shifted a bit. When I finally found my relay team who had been relaxing and drinking when I finished, <laughs> sore, <laughs> tired, and worn out, my friend's sister said to me, hey, you should run a 10K, it's an all-women's 10K race in the fall. And I looked at her and said, I can't run 10 miles, are you crazy? She politely informed me, that a 10K was six miles, and I just did five. <laughs> and so my adventures into the running world began. So I started getting ready for this 10K, and I would run in my neighborhood, but I wasn't just running. I would talk to my mom, I would talk to God, I cried as joy, sadness, grief just rose to the surface. Running became my spirit regenerator. It allowed me to grieve emote feelings, be vulnerable, all the things that strong black women don't do. Over the years of running, that weight, that heaviness of grief started to move a bit. I started to feel and not be so numb. I actually started to get my spirit back. I started to live in the world, not just be in the world. 
after a couple of years of running, I had questions and I had a curiosity about this running space. And it led me to this idea that I had. So I came up with this brilliant, unique, somewhat nutty idea of running a half marathon in every state, which I later found out, yes, it was nuts, but it wasn't that unique and it wasn't that brilliant. <laughs> there were other groups and clubs that do the same thing. But what made my idea, though nutty, unique, was that I wanted to know if there were other black women who ran long distance just like me. When I would run races or run in different neighborhoods, I would be the only person who looked like me, or I'd be one of a few people who looked like me. I wanted to know why this running space, why this running culture seems so white. As a sociologist, an African-American woman, running became more than running. I mean, yes, it was an outlet for my grief and for healing, but it also became part of my research and studying the intersection of race and gender and class and this running space. I didn't know anyone who looked like me who was doing this or saw running through this lens. My, my, my mother always pushed me to explore and push boundaries, and this was the perfect place for it. So as I'm thinking through this idea, I thought, yes, this would be great for my mother to come with me. This will be our mother and daughter trips. And every state that I run, I always wear a flower for her because she's on this journey with me together. Because it was our goal to kind of steady this running space and dismantle it one race, one step, one town at a time. I started this journey 43 months ago, and I just completed my 45th state. <laughs> and there's so many different narratives, themes, experiences that I can't get into them all right here. But I will say two main themes that have keep coming up is one, black women do run, and two, I've learned to push through my fear. So black women run, right? As I started this journey, I, my understanding of black women running changed in state number eight, New Jersey, the Garden State. Now up until that point, yes, I ran a marathon, ran 11 half marathons, but I didn't see myself as a runner. I run and I study running, but I wasn't one. In New Jersey, it was the Trenton Double Cross Half Marathon. And what made me do a double take was that 600 of them were black women. Okay, it was more like a triple take. I was beyond the moon, overly excited. These were women who I normally don't see, right, in magazines, social media, advertisements. These were women who had all different body shapes, skin tone, hair textures. Meaning these women traveled from Philadelphia, from New York, New Jersey, from Maryland, all over the place to run. I didn't know black women traveled to run. They were different social classes. They were of all different ages. Blew my mind. Then I found out there were running groups such as Black Girls Run, Black Girls Rock 50 States, Girls Run, National Black Marathoners Association. It was at that moment November 11th, 2015, when I knew that I was a runner. I was a part of a community that's invisible in this dominant narrative of what a runner should look like, act like, be like. The problem with this invisibleness are the stereotypical assumptions that people have about black women running and belonging in this space. So that we're all clear, this is what a runner looks like. <laughs> Traveling solo to run these races, I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, oh, you're so brave, or oh, I can never travel by myself. As a black woman traveling solo, I'm always scared when I go into a new state. And actually, my bravery should unnerve you. The fact that it's 2019 and I still have to be brave, my bravery is necessity, as a necessity for surviving in a society that still doesn't understand how race and racism works. Every time I run to a new state, I'm always unfamiliar with the state, the area. There are unfamiliar places, there are unfamiliar white spaces. I actually wear an ID bracelet on me every time I run. Well, really, every day for life. 
My ID bracelet has my name, my address, my blood type, my donor status, and my father's phone number. Because I want someone to recognize me or help me if I need help. <coughs> and that is the reality that I'm not gonna sugarcoat. Because we've all heard the stories of what happens to black people in spaces. I trust. But I'm not gonna let the fear of whiteness cripple me from pushing boundaries, exploring, and letting my spirit die. Pushing through my fear, I've been able to see parts of the country that I would never have seen or interact with people that I wouldn't have the chance to. For example, my state number 44, Utah, the Beehive State. I was this there this summer and I visited Arches National Park for the first time. Didn't know such an amazing place existed. However, I chose not to go to Negro Bill Canyon. Traveling throughout the country and throughout this process, I did not realize the strength it takes to hold back my rage when I'm constantly being questioned about my blackness, my black body, and belonging in these spaces. To deal with it all, I have developed these PBS moments. PBS. I pause. I breathe. And I smile before engaging in conversation. Unfortunately, I have so many examples of my PBS moments. But the most recent one happened in my state number 45, Alaska, the last frontier state. So I was in Alaska and I went to the expo to pick up my bib number <laughs> and my running stuff and check out all the vendors. So as I'm there, I'm talking to a vendor, we're talking about running, running in Alaska, no big thing. And so she sees three words that I have on my shirt and she leans in and says, black girls run. And I thought, okay, here we go, PBS moments come. Because it's been my experience throughout this journey that when people see those three words, they have to say it out loud as if it doesn't exist, as if it's not real, as if it's hard to understand. And I always wonder if it said, I don't know, black girls cook, could we all understand that? So I'm getting ready and I'm like, okay, here we go. She continues, well, of course y'all do. And I'm thinking, okay, no PBS moment needed. We're good to go, all right. But she wasn't done. <laughs> She goes on, yeah, your bodies are built for running. That's why you went faster than white women. <laughs> and then we engaged in conversation, and that's a whole other side story. I've got five more states to go. I'm just wondering how many PBX moments I'm gonna have. So. Throughout this journey, it has definitely been an amazing adventure in terms of understanding people, society, race. And when I think back on it, if I could, I would trade all of these experiences if I could have my mother with me in a heartbeat. But in her passing, she's given me an invaluable gift of a renewed spirit, a strong sense of self, community, and belonging. I now know what it means to push through my fear. I now know what it means to be a strong black woman. I now know that black girls do run. This is a strong black woman. Thank you.